welcome. I'm glad we have a small but great group for discussion for this talk. So I'm Beth Nelson, and I'm with the USDA SARE program, which is Sustainable Ag Research and Education. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dan Rossman, who's talking to us about his soybean variety trials today. Okay, thank you very much. The, uh, before we, we talk about the trials themselves, I'll just introduce myself a little bit more. I am a county extension educator in Michigan, right in the center of part of Michigan. My uh, expertise is field crops. Uh, back, I've been an extension educator since uh, 1980, uh, yeah, 1980, it's been 34 years. In 1995, I had a group of farmers come to me in my area and say, we've heard about organics, we want to learn a little bit more about it. And I said, well, I don't know a lot about organics, but I'll learn with you. And we started the journey at that time, and uh, the group has grown, and the number of farmers involved has increased, and, and our knowledge has greatly increased. And along the way, we've come to several different points where we need more information. And the soybean variety is, is, uh, is one problem that we ran into, and this grant has really helped us to try to solve that. And uh, I'll get on with some of this a little bit more. First of all, the soybean challenge. The seed challenges that we had in '95 when we started looking at organics in our area. Uh, back then, everything was non-GMO, so all the companies had seed available that we could choose from, and also um, uh, the uh, uh, there's a lot of data about what varieties were good and, and uh, you know, yield data and so on. So a lot of availability. The rules of organics at that time we didn't have the NOP standards. And so you could still use conventional seed as long as it was non-GMO. There wasn't any big issue with that. But as time went on, we started running into difficulties. Uh, all the major companies that we were used to dealing with no longer carried uh, non-GMO seed anymore. We had the NLP rules that we need to source organic seed whenever we possibly could. And all of a sudden, our choices of seed varieties for soybeans dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. And we were faced with some a few varieties that were 25, 30 years old that we had to choose from. We had some uh, companies that were uh, still having some non-GMO seed available. They call it non-GMO, but when we tested it, we had a problem with seed contamination. It had it was contaminated because they used the same equipment of their uh, glyphosate tolerant seed as they did their non-GMO seed, and there was cross contamination contamination, so that closed some doors on some of those seed sources. Uh, there was very few breeding programs that were available. Uh, the data, we didn't have good data in our area of, of the varieties that were available. Uh, and some of the companies were companies were, were names we weren't used to. And uh, there's just a lack of awareness of what varieties were there. And this next slide here kind of shows the big picture of what has happened in the seed industry. And each one of these, these large circles here actually represents a chemical company. And all of these little lines are ownership or partial ownership of all these other seed companies. And so like Monsanto has bought out all of these small companies, seed companies of all sorts of types. Some of them are quite large seed companies like uh, DeKalb and Asgro, Syngentis. You know, they have the, the Old North or King, the NK varieties, the Golden Harvest, and those type of varieties. DuPont is Pioneer and, and all those other type ones. Now AgriSciences, uh, Dairyland is uh, one that you may, might be familiar with that's under that one. And, and uh, uh, Microgen, uh, then Bear is up in that corner. So all those represents companies and what's their, their main emphasis, these chemical chemical companies, what's their main emphasis of the varieties that they offer? Traits. You know, uh, traded seeds, so they want to sell chemicals too, but all of their, a lot of their choices that you have are, are traded seed. And so, and all the traits, all the traits are GMO traits, and so all of a sudden, all of this research and development that used to be available for all the farmers and even the organic farmers went back years ago. Now they're all GMO traded. All the research and development is going in that area. So we're lacking, a uh, whole pool is gone from our ability to use. 
So we do have, in our mind, a lot of opportunities uh, when it comes to our, our seed. We had producers that were very committed, that were very interested in doing something about the soybean seed dilemma that we had. And we had not only producers, but we had some uh, buyers as well. We, had a, we do have a significant uh, number of acres of production in Michigan. Uh, we were probably over 400,000 bushels in Michigan at the current time. A real key thing that was kind of a hidden jewel was that we had a soybean breeder right at Michigan State University that was working with tofu, non-GMO varieties that we hardly knew existed. And, uh, and we were kind of misled thinking that someday we're going to see some varieties being released from this program, but we were never seeing any. And the main reason is kind of twofold. His, he was getting feedback from the Soybean Checkoff Promotion Committee, which actually is funding most of his work, that the type of varieties that they were looking for were the straight line varieties that do well in narrow rows, shorter uh, plants, and those were just the two opposite characteristics that the organic producers were looking for. So many of the varieties that the organic producers would want to see were being thrown out of the program. And plus the way the, the, the whole system now works as far as varieties being released, it used to be they used to go through the Crop Improvement Association and there'd be these public varieties being released. But now they're all private. And you need to speak up for one of the lines in the breeding program and that's all privatized. So we had never seen them directly. They were always just being fed out throughout private companies uh, for their own use. And so we understood how that whole system worked. And so now lines are being saved and actually selected for organics. And we understand the process to have getting those varieties in the farmer's hands. So in a few years, hopefully we'll see some of that happening. Uh, we all, we, we uh, were aware of the other breeding programs uh, uh, in Iowa State University and, and also in Minnesota, the breeding programs they had and also the private seed companies that have breeding programs brought everybody together uh, for this, this project. And then we had a lot of past experience and success doing on-farm research de demonstration plots of all sorts. So uh, that's kind of the, we saw we had an opportunity here, so we wanted to go forward. We had a first attempt back in 2010. And uh, we had some, we had four sites, we compared 40 varieties. We didn't have any special funding for this first project. There's a strong interest, but we realized right away we can't do this again because we used up all of our um, little tickets of, of favors of, of other researchers and equipment and so on because we had begged, borrowed, and stealed uh, equipment and planners and, and technicians and, and uh, we were told we can't continue unless we have some funding. So we uh, put some grants together, so, uh, some applications, and lo and behold, uh, we had two funders that thought this was a worthy project. And so we worked out a deal both with the Sears Trust and also with, with SARE, that the Sears Trust and SARE, that we'd actually have this be a, a long-term project. So we have six years of funding for this project, which is really, really exciting. We should be able to uh, uh, really advance some varieties during that time. A key part of this whole thing, and, and what was explained earlier, was the farmer's involvement. And we're doing this not just to have a research project. We're not just doing this for some graduate student's uh, master's program or Ph. program. We're doing it to serve the farmers and also to also serve the end consumers who uh, want uh, certain types of, of varieties. And so this, this advisory group is made up of a number of organic farmers to make sure as we go along that it's steered in a direction that's going to benefit them in the end. And one big benefit is that they'll have a number of uh, good quality varieties that meet their agronomic needs, that beats, meets the buyer's needs, it's uh, in their maturity range and those type of things that they're happy with. And also that there'll be an ongoing uh, sustainable type of a system where they can have input of new variety releases and know how to get uh, varieties into their hands through the whole system. Because it is different than it was 20 years ago. Another key part of this advisory group are the buyers because we don't want to have a bean that's just high yielding that has the right agronomic traits. We want a, a beans that also 
meet the demands, whether it's a tofu market or soy milk market or whatever it might be. So we're always, we want to make sure their input is there as well, because a lot of times it'll be the buyers or the seed producers combining together that are an important part of the, how the seed is going to be released and get in the hands of the farmer. And also the MSU soybean breeder. Uh, he is a, a very, very, of course, a central part of this because of the breeding lines, he has access to thousands, literally thousands of lines of soybeans. Uh, and he has this nursery that he can observe and, and make selections through uh, on an annual basis and then put those into uh, his uh, select lines to advance for the producers. And then I'm in the MSU Extension and our job is to coordinate the whole effort, get the outreach and, and share the results with, with producers as well. Here's our trial sites and the, the place where they're located is not just by happenstance. Three of the sites, the, the sites right in here, uh, those sites are sites right on farmers uh, property on-farm research. And then this one is over here is a university uh, certified organic site. All sites are certified organic under organic conditions because that's how we wanted to see how the varieties performed. And this, if you take Michigan and go kind of on a diagonal right here, this is a key part of our production agriculture, our field crops. Now, this area is a good ag producing area too, but there's also something else here called Detroit. And, but uh, so a major part of our ag is right here. Soybeans, this is a major part of the so soybean production area. Probably this thumb area in the central part of the state is the biggest concentration of organic field crop producers as well. So that's why it's kind of uh, located where they're at. The uh, soil type here, this is all lake bed soil. Years ago when the, the glaciers receded, they left lake bed soils and right around the Saginaw Bay here and through the thumb. So this is pretty much all nice loam park hill type soil through this area. So highly productivity, high productivity. This uh, site down here at Kellogg Biological Station, the university site, this site is a uh, part of the glacial moraines and the uh, sand and gravel. So this is a much lighter soil type, a, a sandy loam type system. You look at those, those dots and they look like in 2012 and 2013, they're in the same location, but they've changed just a little bit. Kellogg Biologic, Biological Station, you can see they've uh, same location both years. And then this dot right here at the Brockerty Farm, same location both years. But this uh, changed slightly from Isabella County to Gratia County in 2012-2013. And in Tuscola County, it switched to neighboring farms. The uh, Vollmer farm, he's on the advisory committee. The reason why we had to go away from Mark Vollmer's farm is because they switched from 30 inch rows to 20 inch rows. And the equipment that we have is all 30 inch rows. And that's the majority of the soybean organic producers are all in 30 inch rows, but they switched to 20, so no longer could we fit our equipment with his equipment. He's very much interested, still want to be part of it. And um, Tom was, just thought he didn't have a good enough field for 2013, but he still wants to be part of it as well. So we had some minor switching of producers, but uh, pretty much they're, they're still very committed into the program, even though there's that switch. With, with a row, um, with, with yes. a significant, um, yeah, I don't know if it's probably for the study to try to keep it or was that a little important piece? Well, well, we're keeping the row width 30 inches. But since his farm wasn't 30 inch and went to 20, we had to uh, put the, the trial on his neighbor's farm, who was still in 30 inch. So the trial is all still in 30 inch rows. But the one cooperator, the reason why he didn't stay as a cooperator, is because his whole farming operation switched to 20 inch rows. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry, I should have repeated that. So. Um, I was kind of curious as to, was that a, obviously that was a significant thing for the study, was that a significant thing for that variety? Oh, oh, is oh. that why the 30 inch rows? Oh, why, the, the question is, is it significant uh, of the 20 versus the 30 inch rows? That is a significant item of consideration. We, we have a, a few organic farmers that are in 20 inch rows of 
vast majority are planting in 30 inch rows for the soybeans. Down the road, maybe 5, 10, 20 years from now, we'll have maybe more of the organic farmers in 20 inch rows. But it is, it makes a, a it does make a difference if, if the varieties are planted in 30 inch rows versus 20 inch rows, because then maybe we'd be looking more at the straight line varieties. In the 30 inch rows, the whole thing that we're looking for are the more of the bushy type that will canopy. And if, if we narrow down the rows to, to 20 or 15 or, or 7 inch rows in organics, if we would go down that narrow, maybe then it'd be the straight line beans that we'd be looking at. And that was one issue that we had with the breeder early on. He was selecting just for the, the straight line beans and actually tossing the, the bush type beans from the program. Any other questions related to that? Does that answer a little bit better? Yes. Okay. Okay, our seed sources, of course this is, without our seed sources we couldn't even do a trial like this. The first one is the, the Brockerty Farm. Uh, they were actually, this one right here, was actually keeping that 30 year old variety alive, Vinton 81. Vinton 81 is a, just a a mainstay as far as a soybean variety in the tofu market. It's one that's very highly thought of uh, overseas in Japan and it's a standard that all the other soybeans are tested for as far as to tofu quality. And that variety would probably be non-existent if that particular farm had not kept the certification going year after year of that one variety. And it pretty much came down to that plus a handful of others were the only ones that were being considered because we were running out of sources of organic seed. Uh, DF Seeds in Dansville, Michigan, that is a private breeder in Michigan and he not only does uh, glyphosate tolerant varieties, he also does the non-GMO varieties. And he has produced a couple varieties that has worked very well for organic producers or at least gave us uh, hope that we had uh, somebody actually uh, providing varieties for that particular uh, group of, of producers. Uh, John Deal is the, the breeder there. Organic Bean and Grain, that's actually the, the business name for Vollmers. They're not only a, a producer, but also they're a buyer or receiver of, of organic uh, beans and grain. They, uh, have, they actually bought uh, the uh, rights to a, an older variety that a, seed, a major seed company had that was going away from non-GMO. So they bought rights for, for one variety that's about 15 to 20 years old right now. And uh, that's one we'll talk about a little bit later. Sunopta, they're out, out of Hope, Minnesota, but they're a major buyer of soy milk and also tofu varieties in our area, and a certain amount of feed beans. Schillingers, uh, they're uh, another private seed breeding uh, uh, outfit and uh, they have some genetics that some of the, the uh, uh, growers were, were looking at and, and thinking might be good. Albert Lee is another seed supplier out of Minnesota. Uh, Blue River Hybrids is another one out of I Iowa. And those were the, the private seed sources that uh, we identified that, that we're dealing with and we're always looking to see if we're missing uh, a company. There's some other ones out throughout the United States but having varieties that are actually suitable for our, our area uh, that have the right maturity. So we, these are the ones that we identified that, that we're working with and uh, there could be some more added in the future. The universities we're working with are the ones in the upper Midwest, the uh, University of Minnesota and their crop improvement program, Iowa State University, and then the Michigan State Breeding Program. This is how our plots have been set up uh, for both of our years in 2012 and 2013. We tried to, uh, we want to have over 40 varieties and in 2013 we had 48 varieties. In 2012 we had 51 varieties so it's, we're keeping that quite consistent. The, uh, the way that we set this, these plots up were identical the way that uh, the conventional soybean varieties are all uh, uh, analyzed for their performance uh, on, through the campus program. The state soybean uh, comparison of, of soybean varieties, uh, that we, we model it after their system. As a field crops agent, I've been doing variety testing for 
my whole career, but it's all been on farm scale. And so normally I'm used to having 15 to 20 foot widths going a quarter mile or more across the field using the farmer's equipment. So this is a little bit different for, for me, but it works good in the organics standpoint when we're trying to, to review the performance of this number of varieties. And it would be too expensive on an organic farm to try to have major soybean trials because you know here's the, the area that we're using on one farm is, is a small, small footprint compared to what I described how we normally did extension plots. We'd be taking up 60 acres of their field or more, trying to, to uh, do a good job with um, analyzing the performance of the varieties. So this much smaller footprint is working much better to do this first stage of this analyzing, trying to screen these number of varieties. So we have the four locations of 50 varieties or so. We're replicating every location four times. So we're looking at each variety 16 times. They're all in 30 inch rows, they're two row plots, and um, our plant population is quite high compared to conventional standards, but with organics we've got rotary hoes, we have weeders and cultivators, so we want to make sure we have a good stand so we have a hefty plant population. But all the plots, we plant 26 feet, then we trim them down, and you can see this plot over here is trimmed down to 20 feet, so we have alleyways between it. And that helps not only uh, uh, at harvest time, that we're harvesting just the 20 feet, but when we have the producers come and look at the plots, it gives uh, access to the locations as well. The planter that we use is a Monison planter. It's uh, designed uh, to, uh, it's a very uh, efficient planter, a, a very a good as far as precision. It uh, places the seed very uh, exact where we want it. And it's, uh, it was easy to change the varieties, adapt it to make it a plot type unit. And plus being four rows, we can take it down the road pretty easy on trailers. One key thing of this project is that we just didn't want to plant the plots and, and, and have the yield data for harvest. We wanted the farmers to be actively involved, get to know these varieties, be out in the field during the growing season so they could see the characteristics that were important to them. And you can see the, the different field days that we had. We normally work with the Organic Farmers of Michigan. That's a marketing cooperative and they have a field day and when they have their, their, um, their meeting during the summer, we take them out to our sites that uh, might be close by to their, that type of uh, event. Then I have my own tours where we go to each one of the sites and the farmers evaluate them. And then Kellogg Biological Station has uh, some field days as well. But you can see some pictures of different events. Uh, some were earlier in the season, some were a little later. But the farmers had a chance to look at the varieties, get familiar with them, and see how they looked as far as the canopy, the, the uh, the shape of the plant, the potting of the plant, the maturity of the plant compared to the other ones. And they were able to take notes and pictures and, and talk to one another about them just to get more familiar with those varieties. And so when uh, we were talking about advancing a variety, they were already knew what it was going to be looking like. Okay, okay as far as soybean selection criteria, that's what I want to talk about now. The, the, the producers have a set of things that they're looking at, and the buyers have a, a set of criteria they're looking at, and we have to mess the, mesh the two together. And so the producers, you know, I ask them, what, what are those characteristics that are important to you? Early vigor is, is very important. Why would early vigor be important? Oh, yeah, the, the key thing is you want something that will you know, get out of the ground fast, early vigor, so that help with their weed control. Because they're going to be, you know, doing their rotor hoeing, maybe running a weeder, but then they want to cultivate as soon as they can uh, before the weeds have any size to them to bury up weeds, and they want the plant to have a, some height differentiation of any weeds that may start. So early vigor, they don't want something that will start really slow and takes forever to, to get to cultivator height. Now, I, I have bushy here but they don't want it overly bushy. What would happen if a variety is really, really, really bushy? Well, the, the answer is 
or damage when your rotary hoe or cultivate? Not necessarily. It's later on in the season. I'll help you out a little bit. There's a, a disease called white mold. And if you have something that's too bushy, a lot of times it's more susceptible to white mold. So we need to be a little careful about this characteristic that we don't want a variety that's overly susceptible to white mold, and that's one thing that we're, we look at a little bit as well. And I have it down here. But we want one that's bushy enough so that we do get early canopy. The reason why we want canopy and an early canopy is because if any weeds do escape, and any, if we do have a little weed pressure, the thicker that canopy, the more spindly those weeds are going to be. So if you have a nice thick canopy, the weeds may be there, but they're not going to amount to a lot because you're going to have a lot of competition with the soybeans. We want a variety that's tall or medium tall. We, want, we don't want one that's so small it's hard to get in the combine. And we want one that's, that's tall enough, the same reason as this early canopy, because the taller the bean, the chances are it's going to compete with the weeds better. White mold uh, resistance, like I mentioned here, that is a disease of concern. We are in 30 inch rows, so we have less uh, problem with white mold. But uh, if we do get a, an overly bushy one, that could be a problem. Pod height, of course, uh, any producer may want a, a certain pod height off the ground because if it's too close to the ground, we may lose some of the, the yield. We want a high yielding bean. And if we didn't care about high yielding, we'd stay with a Vinton 81 for the rest of our lives. But, you know, we want one that's going to yield a little better. And we have a maturity that we prefer, uh, a 1.8 to 1 point, up to 2.3. So 1.8 to 2.3 maturity. In Ohio here, you, what do you normally do? A 3, a uh, 3, 2. What's the maturity in Ohio? In Ohio? Three. About a 3. There are some in our program here I'm going to show you that you may want. It's a little too long season for us, but it might be ideal for you. The, briar, the buyers, of course, they're looking at protein, uh, seed size, the taste, hilum color, uh, the germination, uh, then that's something they use uh, to do with the tofu yield and sugar content. And here's some, a little bit more about these criteria. The criteria differs based on what, type, what are we going to be doing about um, the end use? So here's some of our major uses of the soybeans. And one thing is tofu. And that's the premium market uh, right now. That's $28 to $30 a bushel, that particular market. The beans are required to be high protein. And this 37% is 30% uh, uh, as is. Okay. If you go to dry matter, uh, the, the percentage is going to be more like 42, 43 if you do the math. But it has to be a minimum about that 37%. Uh, the Vinton soybeans is usually 39 to 40% uh, at the 13% moisture. Tofu has to be a large seeded bean, usually a, a 20,000, I mean, excuse me, usually 2,000 per pound. Uh, a light or clear hilum, a low oil, high germination. Soy milk beans, that's another uh, big uh, market for, for Michigan producers. The, the protein still ought to be fairly high, but it can be a medium to high protein. The natto bean is a really, really small bean. And it's one that's used in Japan. They, they ferment that, that bean. It has to be a high sugar type bean, very small seeds. And I, I mentioned with the tofu, be about 2,000 seeds per pound. The natto bean is about 45. 100 beans per pound, so quite a lot different. Feed, of course, I, I put unrestricted. I'm not really sure what term I ought to use for that. But the feed beans end up being the beans that are the, uh, they don't make the other classifications here. And sometimes in, somebody will raise a bean specifically for feed because it would be a high yielding bean, maybe a dark colored hilum, so it wouldn't work in these other markets. But they want a higher yield, and so they'll, uh, They'll choose one that might be a, a dark colored hilum, but still be a non-GMO. Then there's some other uses here as well. But these are the major ones that our producers have. The bottom left picture, this one here. Okay, that's the, uh, the natto bean. That's the natto bean. It's a very small bean, and they ferment it. And when they ferment it, it ends up having these, this stringy consistency. Uh, I'm told it smells 
really bad. But it's a, a very a favorable treat in Japan. So, uh, and that is a, 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 a special niche market. So, okay, here's a few pictures just to show you what the plots looked like prior to harvest. And um, the, the plots, we, we had field days at, most, at all the plots, and so most of the plots were all signed. And, uh, and so farmers, not only during the field day, could they go and look at the plots, but they could go through right up until harvest to observe the plots and go back to them and see how things were looking, how they're standing, if they're lodging, uh, the, the order of maturity, and so on. During harvest, that's when we took the, the plant height uh, the uh, uh, measurement, of course, that's when we did the yield. Then after harvest, we in the lab, we did the protein oil and had the seed count. Uh, a little uh, Kincaid combine here is what we use. This is one that uh, Kellogg Biological Station had purchased. And so we were leasing this from them. So it's uh, made for a, a real good uh, opportunity to have a good machine to utilize. Results. One thing that uh, when, when uh, individuals do research, a lot of time they'll, they'll publish a report or something and it, it gets hidden somewhere or left in a file or satisfy their, uh, whoever uh, was sponsoring the results. But one thing we want to do, the whole reason we're doing this is to make sure that the information gets out to the, the, the producers and the end users. So one place where we share the results every year is called the Mid Michigan Crop Report. That's a publication I do in mid-Michigan with a couple other educators with all of our on-farm research. We have probably about 20 to 30 different trials of all sorts of different things that we do. We included this organic work in that report that goes predominantly to all the producers, even the conventional producers, so they can see what's going on. There's over a thousand copies of that that gets uh, spread around mid-Michigan. Then also uh, the results are, are available on the MSU Variety Trial website. It was last year. Uh, we're going to have it on this year. We have some links right now down here where if you wanted to, to get the results right now, the handout that was on the table over here uh, are the results for 2013. In December, I have a, a marketing workshop for the organic producers. And uh, we have anywhere from you know, 30 to 50 or more that would attend that in the thumb. And we pass out the preliminary results at that time to the producers. I also have a mailing list of about uh, 250 organic producers, field crop producers in Michigan, and they were all received a, a, a direct mail with that uh, publication that we did, plus another insert that had the two-year averages on it so they could see. And besides the two-year averages, they also had uh, the steps of how to release, get a variety released, the whole procedure of how varieties advance. So they could see that, and if there's one that they like, they know the procedure. Okay, I like that variety. How can we get that released uh, to the producers? Also, the seed suppliers that are part of our program, they have the results as well, and they can use it through their channels. And then here's the links uh, through the MSU Cover Crop site. There's other meetings that we've had as well that we've talked about the results. I was in Ontario at a meeting. I shared the, the, the results with the, the group that I talked to there. I'm going to have an MSU research reporting session that I'm going to be a part of in March. It's going to be March the 7th, and this will be one of the, the topics that will be talked about and shared as well. How are we doing so far? Well, here is uh, just uh, a few of our numbers of the performance. One thing that's exciting, 2012, what was, a, what was production like in your area, area in 2012? You had a major drought. Well, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you that in the central part of Michigan, in where we were at and where most of these plots were at, we actually got rain. Timely rain right at the nick of time. And I'm embarrassed because we didn't have, we had the best soybean yields in history in our area. And um, as you can see in 2012, we had some of the individual varieties, uh, in individual reps, yielding over 70 bushel to the acre. And just, just unbelievable. The Tus Tuscola site and the Lapeer site in 2012, both of them 
yield in the high uh, 50 bushels, you know, 59, 56. The Kellogg Bi Biological Station in 2013 actually had rain this year, and they were nearly 60 bushel average. Another key thing is, you remember I mentioned this Vinton 81, that was that standard soybean for the tofu market. And one thing that we're trying to do is find varieties that are going to be as good or better to replace that variety. And we, have, we identified seven varieties that had protein uh, that qualified and then they yielded more than the Vinton. Yielded four or more bushels more than the Vinton. Seven of the, the type of varieties. And we had several companies actually approach the, the MSU breeder saying, hey, I'm interested in this variety, I'm interested in that variety. So we're starting that, that, that process that some of these may be released. Here's a few of the promising lines, and I just want to mention this one. This is one that you're going to, to uh, you'll see some more data in a moment. 5181, it's a tofu variety, 5181, remember that. Then the other one, you can't see it as good, but that's 7130. Those are two varieties in particular. There's several other ones that are of high interest. Here's the performance of, of the tofu type varieties. Remember I said there's seven varieties or so, and I might have added another one in here. But here's the Vinton bean. And you can see the red bar is the performance in 2012. The blue bar is the performance in 2013. And you can see that all of these tofu type beans outperformed this one. So these all have merit. These are all exciting beans to look at. These two are ones that have been used by organic farmers. And here's this 5181. Over eight bushels better. This variety here has been tested for tofu quality and it meets the, the Vinton 81. Very similar as the Vinton 81 for tofu quality. Eight bushel better. And uh, the breeder has 350 pounds today ready for increase. So it's not very much, but it's the first stage of increase. So we're quite excited about the potential of this one. This one here, too, uh, is another one. One that's a, this, what's exciting about this variety is that it actually has a protein level higher than this one that's the same or higher than this one. This makes the tofu, quali tofu quality, but this one has a lot of the other traits. This is a medium height one, this is a tall one. This one is a little earlier maturity, so this one may be, even though it's not yielding as much, may have some other traits that we're looking for as well. So we're quite excited about this. Uh, this one right here from Iowa, you can see it, it looks like it's very close to this one here. The trouble with this one is it's a group three maturity. Okay, the question is, did the buyers blend beans based on protein pads? They, they can, but one thing that they're looking for is consistency. So they, they can do a blend, but they need consistency. And they need taste as well. So it's depending on what they're doing, what their formula is, and so on. They can get in trouble if they're, they're blending too much. So like, if you're from Beverly, yeah. you might get a better price if it's a higher protein content. Yeah. Oh yeah, well that's the whole thing in the, the tofu type varieties. Predominantly we were getting a much lower yield with a high protein variety, but we're getting a higher premium. Uh, the premium for the tofu types, like I said, is like that $28 to $30 a bushel. Feed grade beans are, are quite high, but it's down to like $24, $25 a, a bushel. Okay, here's a little bit I mentioned already that one a new one from Michigan State, the 5181, does have an 8.8 .8 bushel advantage over the Vintons. If you put an ec a dollar per acre, $250 roughly uh, to the producer. And, uh, and, and then some of the other current varieties, like I mentioned, the, uh, there was uh, some other ones on the list that uh, farmers have uh, available to use. Some of the other tofu varieties that the private companies have is about a four bushel increase over those, so about a hundred dollars an acre. Here's the other type varieties. These would be the soy milk varieties, the feed type. These all have lower protein levels. And here's an exciting one from Michigan State. Uh, the 10 
17.4. The one issue with this one, that's like a 2.9. So this is a good one for Ohio. This uh, DF seeds, another high yielding one. And you can see how well that one is doing. But uh, that is a longer maturity one as well about a 2.6 or so. This Iowa variety, another one that's a little too long season for us. But you can see those are, are performing real well. This one is probably one of the, the, the better ones for our area, the right maturity. And uh, that one will likely be advanced uh, for, for our area. And here's some of the, the key ones here that are um, looking exciting for our area too. This is the one that was purchased by the Vollmer family, the, the organic bean and grain from a private company. And so they, they tried to save this. So this was the other standard that we were going for, by. So this is kind of the standard in the soy milk or the, the non-tofu market. And the other, the Vinton was a standard in the tofu. So those were the two targets we're trying to be as good or, or, or performing better. You know, we were lost really on, on how do these varieties get from the breeder Get, and get in the farmer's hands. And so here's the steps to, to advance the MSU soybean varieties to the farmers. And so they first have to, you first have to identify a variety you like and let the breeder know. Then he goes through the university process. And then there has to be another process with the uh, soybean promotion committee because they own the rights to these varieties. And then eventually you get seed to, to increase the breeder will increase it, then you get some seed to increase, and you do your own evaluations. And then if you like that, then you name it, and then you, a couple years later, then you'll have enough seed to, to, to put it on the market. So there's a few years involved in here to, to make the process work. And, you know, the one thing, we thought this was all automatic, and we are waiting for these varieties to pump out of the system, and they weren't being pumped out. We realized we had to be a part of the system. And so we all realize that now, and we're all working to make that happen. Initial steps, additional steps that we want to do, I mentioned that you know, we're doing these, we're looking at about 50 varieties every year. Okay, and we're looking at them in these small plots, and that's real good. We're getting a good handle on that, but we want to do the next step is to make sure that if we put them in a whole field or, or put them in strips of field with farmer's equipment, that they're really going to be performing the way the farmers want to. So what we want to do, once we identify three or four varieties, or just one or two varieties even, or when we get enough seed for them, we want to start putting them on, on farmers' farms and have field-scale trials. And uh, then we want to make sure we continue to communicate our findings, making sure that um, we're not just doing this all in a vacuum and no one's going to hear what we're doing and it's never going to go anywhere. We want to make sure that there's good communication, a good sharing the findings. We want feedback back not only to our breeder, but also the, the breeder at Iowa State, and also the breeder up in Minnesota, and also the private companies. We want a good communication going back. And eventually, we want to have some excellent varieties in release to the farmers, and not relying on genetics and, and varieties from 30 years ago. And we have some up-to-date varieties and uh, moving the whole industry forward. Now, we could stop right here and have some questions, or you can take a look at these individual varieties and individual characteristics. I'm not sure what you want to do here. I, these are... Uh, what do you think about Pioneer? Pioneer, Pioneer is an excellent company, and Pioneer uh, is, you know, under, is owned by DuPont. Pioneer has just a couple varieties um, that are uh, available as a non-GMO in our for our area, and um, one thing we need to be careful of is making sure that um, those varieties that uh, they have are um, not contaminated, and that's a, a key concern is how they're being produced and so on. Just like any other company, and uh, you probably have a list of some there. We we had. Uh, Pioneer, we have, we've had a couple Pioneer in some of our other trials, non-GMO trials, but um, uh, they're not all clear hylum, they're not all tofu type varieties, they're more of the feed type, but... Um, uh, it's not what you think, think about, 
Well, they're invited to participate, so. I, I brought across some stuff on Pioneer, and I, myself, I do not want anything to do with it anymore. Okay. I have it here. Uh, that, that's maybe something that we can, we can, we can talk, talk about, about later. Afterwards. We can talk about yeah, later, so okay? We'll, Let's we'll, talk about we'll later. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so there. Good. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, fertility and weed management? I, I can, but we'll talk, we can talk about that later too, uh, because there's a lot to do with fertility and weed management. We can talk for our plants, you mean? Oh, for our, for our trials. The fertility is all based on what the farmers have normally, what they normally do with their practices for the rest of it. So most of them build up their fertility for the corn in their rotation. And uh, so uh, ahead of these plots, usually there's not. Uh, uh, additional nutrients put on, depending on what their soil tests have been and, and what their practice are. But uh, a lot of them are u utilizing livestock manure or poultry manure, and they don't need the nitrogen for soybeans, so of course that goes on ahead of the corn. And then they have extra phosphorus and potassium for the soybeans. If they're not put, have enough uh, potassium, then they may put on uh, potassium sulfate, something like that. Did you, did you test soil um, How consistent they were with it? Uh, part of their certification is required that they need soil tests, so that's part of their certification. I don't have the, the, the soil test records for them. And weed management was just an individual? The, the weed management, uh, yeah, it's all based individually, but the plots themselves, uh, if there was a weed issue or problem, we had some technicians go out there and, and, and clean them up a little bit. So the weed pressure was, was minimal. But here's the Vinton variety here, and you can see that the protein is about a 40% protein. That, that 5181 is actually a 37%, so it is a little lower protein. That is one concern. But this is a real tall bean at 40 inches. And uh, here's uh, the 5181 shorter bean at 32 inches. So it is a shorter bean, but it, it does have that... Uh, eight bushel yield advantage, and also it is ready to be released. So, so ready to be released. So how many years then? Okay, well, from, from the breeder standpoint, they've increased the seed they they, for, to, to that uh, 350 pounds. Yeah. And that seed goes on, and then that's increased by whoever's interested in it. And then all the documentation have to be signed through the university and the soybean promotion committee. And then they can test it out then when they have enough seed build up. So two more years, two more years. And here's just some of the other ones if you want to take a look at some of, you know, this is the one that I, is most like the Vinton as far as the height, the seed size, and plus still having a, a premium yield on it. So I almost think this is more of a replacement, a direct replacement for the Vinton. The other one looks like it will, could replace it. This one could replace it. Uh, this one might be a, a tofu, it might be a good soy milk replacement. And this one uh, is almost a perfect replacement for the Vinton. So those are the, the, probably, to me, the two most exciting ones. Here's the one I mentioned. that This is the highest yielding one over all of the plots, hands down. But you see the protein is a lower protein level, and the maturity is too, too long for us. But 55.8 bushels over all locations for two years. This is an excellent producing one. So Ohio, there you go. And uh, this is probably the, uh, the highest yielding non-tofu one that's in our maturity range that uh, is pretty exciting to probably be released for uh, soy milk. Here's the natto bean. Very, very small. You look at the pods, you say, this is, boy, that's potted up. But the beans are really, really small. And so you can see the yield is quite low, too, in comparison. So there's some of the private companies, Iowa. Iowa, this was actually uh, almost tied for the highest yielding one in the, the trial. But see, the maturity is a little bit too long for the organic producers. And this is one that uh, very strong, non-tofu type variety, uh, the right maturity, high yielding one. But you can see the seed size. For tofu, we need the, the seed size more of a, a 2,000. That's uh, too small for that. 
but would be good for uh, perhaps a feed type bean. This is the one that was bred in, in Michigan uh, through the DF seed program. Uh, had a lot of excitement about this variety, but the key thing here is 2.5 is just still a little bit too long maturity for, uh, for, the, uh, for the organic producers. Because one thing that we do for weed control is delay planting a little bit. And it, this can get us in trouble. But you can see the protein, protein is right there for tofu. And uh, the seed size is good, the yield is good, but the maturity scares us a little bit. We've had producers use this, but sometimes we get scared with it. This is uh, probably one of the uh, uh, substitutes right now on the marketplace for the uh, Vinton. This has been available for a few years. Albert Lee is uh, selling this, but it's an Iowa number, 2053. One thing wrong with this one is that it is a nice bushy, uh, shorter type plant. It is 36 inches, so it's not real short, but it has was, it does have some white mold issues, that particular variety. So, any other questions? Okay. I have some questions. Yeah. I'm just not sure if there might be outside of your, um, outside of your topic. Or not. Mm -hmm. um, so, in my situation, I, I actually don't do that farming myself. I work with farmers who farm my land. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm interested in moving in this direction, and I'm sure they're not. Okay, so so you're a soybean producer, you said earlier, yeah. and you have a farm, but you're going to conventional farm is what you're right, saying. Correct. And you're wondering, do I want to be an organic farmer or not? Well, I, I would love to be. Yeah. But, uh, but finding the, people who are willing to work. Okay, so you own, you own the land, and so you're the landlord, and you don't think your tenants would be interested in switching. Well, who knows? Yeah. Um, I, I'd have to sell it. I have to oh, sell, sell, sell the idea to them. Sell the idea yeah. that, you know, this is going to be good for everybody. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot of barriers, like yeah, contamination or product. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah if, they're, if they have a dual, if they have some of their land that they're raising conventional uh, GMO type crops on it, and then they want to farm yours organically, they got to be very, very careful because of the contamination issue. Yes. Right. And that's that, but you, some people do it, and there's some certifiers that will work through it with you and, and help uh, make that happen. But it is a more difficult, and you're looking at it a lot more carefully. Uh, I can talk to you quite a lot about uh, things that you may want to utilize as, to help sell the idea for, for the producers. What I found with conventional producers, either they, they're open to the idea or they don't even want to listen to it. And so if, I don't know how, who your producers are and how receptive they are, but if they are not receptive at all, then you have two choices is just continue to, to utilize those individuals for your, as your farmers and, and as your managers and let them do what they want to do and, and work with them. Or you just, over time you decide, well, if that's the route you want to go, then identify somebody who might be willing. And if they're willing to talk to you, well then, then uh, there's way, there's mentors, there's people that you can talk to. Uh, you have uh, a couple certifiers here in Ohio. Uh, you have a, a Global Organic Alliance, just uh, the other side of Columbus here somewhere, that is an uh, outstanding certifier. And I think the, uh, 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 this, this organization here is a certifier too. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Okay. So I know several of you have questions you're going to follow mm -hmm. up with, but I want you to be able to get to the next session. And I want to thank Dan for driving down for this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.